to give a very short history of how we got into biological control, which has proven to be very interesting. Our earlier work that dealt with kind of the quorum sensing, the population size behavior of the pathogen and how it's as a complicated lifestyle going between plants and insects. And that was regulated by the accumulation of that fatty acid that you see in the center of the slide, what we call DSF. The accumulation of DSF changes the behavior of the pathogen from one that colonizes plants to one that can be vectored by insects. And knowing that, it suggested uh, that we can actually control disease by prematurely expressing the presence of DSF in a plant, not relying on the pathogen to build up high populations to make in this case, transgenic plants that might produce the pathogen and hence confuse the pathogen into not wanting to be a plant pathogen. So in the past years, we've shown how this was actually quite successful. And this was one of the transgenes that Dave Gilchrist mentioned earlier this morning. But the world may or may not be ready for transgenic plants. And so we wanted to look at other strategies that we could also achieve pathogen confusion such as by having endophytic or uh, endophytic bacteria that might produce DSF. But we looked long and hard to find bacteria that would grow very well in plants that might act as a surrogate for the expression of genes from the pathogen that would enable them then to produce DSF as well. But we weren't able to find any within endophytes and California grapes, but we did find another strain that others had reported to be an endophyte of tomatoes and some other plants Paraburcaldaria phytofermens that we're going to talk about today that we did in fact find to be an excellent colonizer of grapes. And here you can see on the line, it, it achieves populations of a million or more near the point of inoculation, and within a few weeks can move a meter or more in the plant. So it looked like just exactly what we wanted as a surrogate host for production of DSL. It does itself not produce DSL, so everything I'm going to talk about now is not at all related to the, the signaling that we talked about before. But what was really very dramatic and unexpected was the fact that when we inoculated our plants with the uh, paraburcaldaria and then challenged them with the pathogen, we found that in the gold line, the pathogen can produce large amounts of disease over time. The blue line showed that when paraburcaldaria was also present in the plant, we got virtually no disease. We did this over and over. We got repeatedly no disease when both strains were in the plant together. And this could be explained then when we actually looked at the pathogen population itself. And let's look at four weeks and eight weeks. Just look at the bottom curve for the bottom box. And the gold is the population of the pathogen when it was inoculated alone into the plant. And that purple line at the very bottom showing basically no detectable pathogen in plants where they had also been co-inoculation with paraburcaldaria. Paraburcaldaria populations in between were again reasonably high, not as high as a pathogen, but somehow in the presence of the paraburcaldaria, the pathogen was basically undetectable. And this was not restricted to just the first grape variety when we compared it in Chardonnay and Thompson and Cabernet. We all saw the very same phenomenon. Let's look at the top one, for example, Chardonnay, gold line, pathogen alone, the blue line pathogen in the presence of the paraburcaldaria. Again, dramatic reductions in disease when paraburcaldaria was also in the plant. Now, all of our studies to that point had been inoculating plants in a way that we classically use to inoculate the pathogen. was pointed out this morning where we simply put drops of bacterial inoculum that you see on the center of that stem, puncture it with this needle, and the negative tension of the vessels draw that inoculum into the plant. But that wouldn't be at all practical if we ever thought about moving forward as a strategy to control disease in the field. We considered other strategies to get the bacteria into the plant in a much more feasible way. And that was to use uh, penetrating surfactants, organosilicon surfactants that have been used to enable herbicides and other materials to go into the plants. When used at a relatively high concentration, allow a spontaneous stomatal infiltration of liquids from the surface of the leaf into the leaf. These dark green specks that you see here is basically where the liquid bacterial suspension, in this case, was taken straight into the plant, filled up the intercellular spaces, causing them to uh, look dark green. With this method, we can get large numbers of bacteria, and we get 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 6, you see in that top gold line, when we inoculated the leaves with the uh, paraburcaldaria together with the uh, surfactant. 
quite a large number in the petioles themselves in the black line. And again, very few of any bacteria can be taken up naturally without the surfactant in the blue and the yellow on the bottom because they cannot penetrate through the stomata. But the surfactant enables them to go directly into the plant. And it was very heartening to see then that we could actually get good disease control by simply spraying the paravertical dairy onto the plant. And the green line shows disease progression of inoculation with the pathogen alone, and the purple line is where we had sprayed the paravertical dairy on at about the same time as the pathogen being inoculated. And again, you can see a very dramatic reduction in disease. What was even more dramatic, and what I want to focus mostly on today, is the fact that these types of uh, biological control agents, we'll call them, are typically most effective when used as a preventative. We pre-colonize the plants with a preventative organism, and that somehow can prevent the growth of the pathogen. But what we found is that, yes, we can see protection when we apply the paravertical dairy before the pathogen. As you see here in the light blue and the, and the orange line in the middle compared to the top line, which is, again, pathogen alone. But when we actually applied the, the paravertical dairy by either needle inoculation or by spraying three weeks after that of the pathogen, pathogen plant had already become infected, but we could again prevent disease from ever appearing when we had applied that paravertical dairy. Again, it could act as an eradicant, which surprised the heck out of me. And, and it's really the focus of what we're going to talk about today is how long after the plants have become infected might we see this type of an eradication? Now, what do we think is going on? Uh, it relates a lot to what you heard Caroline uh, talk about this morning, in that it appears that this must be mediated by the plant. It doesn't seem likely that the paravertical dairy could be producing any kind of an antibiotic that would have any hope of eradicating the presence of the pathogen uh, after it had well established a plant. So we looked for evidence that we were somehow stimulating a disease resistance phenotype in the plant that would otherwise have been susceptible. What I show here is an expression of PR1 gene on the top and the ETR1 gene in the third panel down on plants that were either uninoculated, the C on the right hand panel, B, which is inoculated with paravertical dairy alone, BX is where we had put both paravertical dairy and the pathogen and X being the pathogen alone. If you look at the very right hand uh, column then, where pathogen alone is very much like what Caroline Roper showed you this morning. We saw little of any evidence of the expression of PR1 gene, a gene that's typically associated with a defensive reaction. Again, we didn't see much expression of that in an inoculated plant either, as we would expect. You see a modest expression within that circle of the plant's inoculated with paravertical area alone. But you see a very stronger effect expression of that gene when both paravertical area and the pathogen were co-inoculated together. And if you look down on that panel for the ETR1 gene, you see a very similar pattern. You get a very strong induction of that resistance trait when both the paravertical area and the pathogen were present. So we see this as evidence of what we would call priming of the innate immune system. The pathogen alone does not seem to be well recognized by the plant. That's probably why it's so successful. And there is some stimulation of that, some recognition of that pathogen, perhaps, and even the paravertical dairy alone when it is in the plant. Now, some continuing work is going on. Caroline is continuing on one aspect of our continuing study to do global transcriptomics on these plants. This is just a snapshot that I'm showing you. And hopefully we will be able to show you more data soon on what are the whole complex of genes that are going to be expressed in the plant when both paravertical dairy and the pathogen are present compared to when only the pathogen or when only paravertical dairy was present. We are very unfortunate that sequences haven't yet come back. Otherwise, we would hopefully have shown you that data today. Now, we do evidence, though, that there is a stimulation of host defenses, not just by gene expression work, but also by measuring the reactive oxygen species that Caroline also talked to you this morning about. We're measuring the reactive oxygen species in a couple of ways. One is just to grind up the tissue and measure it with this Amplex red reagent. And what you'll see then is by looking at that third column from the left, where we have plants that had been inoculated with the pathogen and the paravertical daria, you see substantially higher amounts of reactive oxygen compared to pathogen alone or the untreated control 
Paravercals area alone also seemed to stimulate it and react with oxygen a bit, but not as much as when both bacteria were present. But to also look at how persistent and particularly how uh, extensive this reactive oxygen response seemed to be, we used an assay similar to what Caroline showed you this morning, where we took stem segments at the point of inoculation of the bacteria, as well as one, two, three internodes away, some 50 or more centimeters away from where the bacteria were inoculated. When we press those down onto this uh, DAB impregnated nitrocellulose filters, which you can turn brown if there's a reactive oxygen species like peroxide. In healthy controls, as you can see, there's little or no brown present. But what was interesting is that we saw throughout the plant, in this case, seven days after a mixture of both paravercaldaria and the pathogen were inoculated, we could see that there was reactive oxygen basically throughout that plant. And quantitatively on the right-hand side with the orange bars is a, a, basically a quantification of how brown those were, a measure of how much peroxide there was. You'll see that there was consistently a lot more peroxide in the plants than we see both the paravercal dairy and the pathogen compared to the pathogen alone. And it was surprisingly persistent. Not only was it apparently systemic within the plant, which was a bit surprising, but it was also very persistent. When we looked 10 days, 14 days later, again, we continued to see high levels of, of peroxide present in plants co-inoculated with both bacteria. And again, little or no evidence of the peroxide when there was pathogen alone. The pathogen is not perceived, but there is a perception of one or both when they're both present. So we've been interested then under field conditions, do we see the same phenomenon that we've been seeing in the greenhouse? And really to look at the issues of, is it practical to be considering the application of these bacteria by spray application, as you see in the upper left, as compared to say the more direct inoculation that you see on the lower right. So what we did then was a number of field studies where we inoculated the paravercal area at different times relative to the pathogen, both by spray or by direct inoculation, putting them in either before the pathogen was inoculated or quite some time after it was inoculated. And again, even in the field conditions, we were very pleased to see that you could get very good penetration of the bacterial suspension, again, showing the water soaking interior of the leaves where Within just a minute of application, you see the bacteria within the plant. And again, showing the light blue curve on the top, a million or more bacteria per gram of tissue that was found in the leaf, all the darker blue in the petioles themselves, quite high numbers that were persistent in the plant after we had inoculated by the spraying with the surfactant. Now, <clears throat> we have done a number of field studies, mostly at the UC Davis field campus. As a comparison, I want you to focus on the dark blue bar that's on just left of the center. That is the control xylem, xylella inoculation. And what we did was to look at the degree of, of disease as measured by the fraction of disease leaves on a given shoot that was inoculated on plants that were inoculated both by needle spray application. And you'll see those that were applied before the pathogen to the left of that first large dark blue bar, but also to the right, the, the blue and the green to the right of that as well, where we had inoculated by both needle and spray four weeks after that of the pathogen. So as we have seen in the greenhouse, we got as good if not better control of disease. And in this case, about a four to five fold reduction in the amount of disease leaves that we would see when we had inoculated either before or after the pathogen with the paravercled area. And very similar <clears throat> results were obtained a year later when we looked at Chardonnay. Again, disease was much reduced, four or five fold, when applied spray or needle before, as well as and after that of the uh, pathogen as well. Now, we can learn a lot about what was going on in this situation by looking at the distribution of the disease severity among those many shoots. If we had 10 replicate plants, we had four shoots on each plant that we inoculated, so we had 40 individual shoots that were inoculated with the pathogen alone in the top box, as well and to compare that with just the bottom box as well, where we had, in this case, applied the paravercal area as a needle before we had inoculated with the pathogen. If you look at the top box, and again, this is the frequency distribution of the disease severity, and you'll see that in that upper box, most of the leaves show very 
complete or very high levels of disease severity, some 70, 80, or 100% of the leaves on an inoculated shoot were symptomatic. A few had escaped infection because of the way we had inoculated. But compare that pattern on the top box with the bottom. What we see was that the most common observation was that those shoots that had been co-inoculated showed no disease at all. So remember, we had reduced the average fraction of leaves that were symptomatic by about fivefold. But it wasn't that all the leaves became symptomatic but simply showed less symptoms. What we actually saw was that it was an all or none response. That most commonly, they escaped disease completely, even though it had been inoculated with the pathogen when paraverticularia was present. There were a few that did not escape. But again, some five-fold more escaped disease completely compared to our, our untreated plants. Now, one of the other interesting things that we've observed in working with the biological control agent is that it grows quite quickly in the plant. I showed you growth curves earlier, and here's another set where with time, what we're looking at is the log cells per gram. By day three through day five, it's increased some hundredfold or more. What we often saw was that after five or six, seven weeks, the population then started to crash. And often by 10 weeks or more, they are undetectable in the plant. In our continuing field work, we're also seeing that by the end of the summer, those that had been inoculated with the paravertical daria, either alone or with an infected plant, uh, they become undetectable. So this raises the question then is how can we best deploy the biological control to achieve disease? Again, it can be effective when applied before the pathogen, and strikingly it is effective when it is applied even after the plant is inoculated with the pathogen. Now look at the green curve, the green bell-shaped curve is our expectation of the temporal pattern of the presence of Burkholderia in the plant. It builds up a population and eventually it crashes. If we were to apply the Burkhold area much before that of the pathogen, there is a likelihood that its population size would crash to a sufficiently low level that it would not be present in high enough levels to induce this priming of disease resistance. On the other hand, since we apparently see an induction of this resistance when both cells are present in the plant at the same time, it can explain why we can expect then some eradication of the pathogen. So look at the blue curve on the left where we've inoculated the pathogen before that of the uh, paraverkal daria in the green. The pathogen would start taking off and growing, but as paraverkal daria, which was inoculated later, started to build up a population, in principle, we would start to see within the plant the plant perceiving both bacteria together, getting a priming event that we perceive to be happening. And then you see the dotted line showing basically a crashing of that pathogen population. At the last in-person PD meeting, one of the questions raised by the audience was, how long after the plant has become infected with the pathogen can we expect there to be an eradication of the disease and the eradication of the pathogen by a subsequent inoculation with paraverkal area. So for the last couple of years, and we spent quite a lot of time in looking at that. How long is too long to try to eradicate the pathogen? So we did some very elaborate field studies at Davis again over the last two years. And it's a complicated design where basically we went out every week. So we inoculated the pathogen on this timeline that we see as zero, kind of towards the left middle of the plot of the timeline on the x-axis. We're starting three weeks before the pathogen, two weeks before, one week before, and then weekly after to some 10 weeks after we had inoculated the pathogen, did we, in this case, spray paraverbal daria on the Cabernet Sauvignon plants. And what we're looking at then is the, the fraction of the leaves on the shoots that we had inoculated with the pathogen that showed symptomatic leaves. And the control, again, is the far most right bar, the XF control where we see some 60% or more of the leaves were infected or symptomatic. What we saw then was a very interesting pattern. If you move from the left hand all the way to the right, we see a similarly low fraction of leaves uh, symptomatic until we get to about five weeks after inoculation with pathogen and having the paravocal there present. Good disease control when applied at any time before the pathogen, 
and decent disease control up to about five weeks after the uh, pathogen had been applied. After about five weeks, you see the disease starting to increase. The longer and longer we waited before we had applied the paravircal area, and by around nine or 10 weeks, it approached the level of disease control that we would see after about 12 or 14 weeks when the disease was eventually eroded. So again, we see what looks to be very good and equally good eradication of the uh, pathogen when applied to up to around five weeks after that of the pathogen. And this was done in a similar vein, again, in another study where we had, in this case, inoculated it directly into the plant, into Chardonnay. And again, we saw about a five-week cutoff. After around five weeks after the pathogen was present, we could no longer fully eradicate the disease, even though it did get continued somewhat lower uh, left cell disease than we saw with our pathogen control over on the right. But again, before about five weeks after the plants had been infected, we could still get quite good eradication. Looking at under the field now, what is the distribution of disease severity among those shoots? Again, we had many shoots on these plants that were inoculated with a pathogen alone on the top, or just compared with the bottom one, inoculated with the paravircal area two weeks after that of the pathogen. Again, you went again from the pattern where most if not all of the leaves on a shoot that had been inoculated with the pathogen alone were symptomatic, very high levels of disease, all the bars over on the right hand side. And compare that with the bottom one where again, most commonly we see that most of those shoots were in fact completely free of disease. Again, it's an all or none or a systemic effect. There are some that escape the protection, in this case, the eradication after two weeks, but for the most part, there was a complete eradication in around 80 to 90% of the shoots, which had both bacteria in it. Now, the way the studies were done in the field, we had these large plants, the plants were four years old at that point. They had been pruned into cordons with four cordons, and we had inoculated one shoot in each of the four cordons on a given plant. And we could keep track of the disease on all of the other shoots that were inoculated on that plant to see whether in fact we could expect a systemic effect on a given plant. That is, if you had inoculated that upper shoot on the upper right hand shoot in this plant, if you would, if it had become protected because of this apparent systemic effect in that particular shoot, did that also result in a systemic effect reducing the likelihood of disease in the rest of the shoots on that same plant? So again, in this case, we're going to look at the incidence of infection of the four shoots on a given plant. We had, again, 10 plants for each tree. Let's compare the upper right-hand box, which is, again, our control, inoculated only with the pathogen, and as you would expect, most of the shoots were infected, and so in most cases, either four of the four shoots that were present on a plant were symptomatic, or three of the four were. Let's just compare that then with the distribution of the incidence of infection from plants such as the lower left, where we had inoculated the paravircal area before that of the pathogen. Again, we had reduced the incidence of disease in any one shoot dramatically by about fourfold. But the real question was, do we see an excessive frequency with which none of the shoots on a given plant would have shown any disease, which would be what you would expect if it had been a systemic effect on a plant basis as opposed to on a shoot basis. And by looking in these other three boxes, you'll see that, yes, there were a number of cases where all of the shoots on a given plant that had been inoculated with the pathogen were protected in the presence of the paravircal area. But that example of no plant, no shoots out of all four was not higher than expected by chance. So it really appears then that we've reduced overall the likelihood of infection dramatically by fourfold or so, which is probably more important than having simply reduced the level of disease that you would see in a plant that eventually became infected epidemiologically, but it does not have evidence that in fact it is a systemic effect over these large plants. What we think is going on is that we do see a systemic and perhaps a directional systemic 
response to the presence of paravercularia and the pathogen together. And that I show by the little red no disease sign on that particular shoot that when we have both bacteria present, we reduce dramatically the likelihood that that pathogen will persist in that shoot. And that shoot as a whole is then protected. But we don't see much evidence that that systemic effect that happened in that shoot will be transmitted to another shoot on the same plant. Either the systemic signal that is required or the movement of the reactive oxygen species or what have you that is responsible for this eradication may be directional and that we do not see a backward movement, if you would, in this case, protection occurring basally away from where protection was happening. It will occur apically, perhaps, on a given shoot, but not down the plant or down a particular cordon. So I'll just summarize that we're very excited about the biological control. It's working much more dramatically than we would have ever expected. It seemed to have properties that make it particularly useful in disease management and that we are completely eliminating disease when successful. It's again, on average, around 80 or 90% reduction in the incidence of infection. And more importantly, it is eradicative that we don't have to anticipate the presence of the pathogen and have the, the paravircal area present, that we in fact can come in and eradicate disease even after it might be starting to appear. So this would seem to have some real practical implications in that it would seem feasible to apply the bacterium once at most twice during the season because it is persistent for some throughout the plant, but also it had the ability to eradicate the pathogen over some five weeks or more after it might already have become infected. And it also, because it can be directly applied to the foliage, we have a fairly easy and practical way to apply it to the many shoots on a plant to hopefully achieve this high level of eradication. So we have high hopes that it really could be a very powerful disease control strategy. Thanks very much.